Thank you, everyone. Uh, good evening. I'm Larry Moan, president of the Manhattan Institute. Thank you for joining us for the 14th annual Hayek Lecture. We're here to honor the legacy of the Austrian economist and political philosopher Friedrich Hayek and to demonstrate the enduring relevance of his ideas to contemporary life. In the 1940s, Hayek saw countries across Europe flirting with central planning and warned of the road to serfdom that such policies would create. This foresight was borne out by the next half century of world history, during which countless millions suffered and died under the yoke of centrally planned states. Hayek's eloquent advocacy for individual liberty against a tide of collectivism made him one of the greatest thinkers of the 20th century and one of the Manhattan Institute's guiding lights. That's why we are so grateful for the generous generosity of Thomas and Diane Smith who have supported the Hayek Prize since its inception in 2005. Before we begin, uh, we created a short video that highlights the many outstanding finalists our prize committee considered this year. I hope that you enjoy it. Friedrich von Hayek was an Austrian economist who lived in England. And at the end of World War II, he wrote a book called Road to Serfdom. That book caught fire. There was a cartoon version, which was published in Look magazine. Hayek's essential observation was that personal freedoms depend on economic freedoms. War is the beginning of the road to serfdom because government takes over and then it doesn't let go. Cut to a few years later, 1955, 1958. Socialism is a dead doctrine in the West. What they say is we want to have social welfare programs. That sounds benign, but it is insidious as well. Hayek wrote a book called The Constitution of Liberty, in which he said, in peacetime, gradual incremental additions of social welfare programs give the state control. Eventually, the state controls more than half of the economy and you're at serfdom again without calling it socialism. What the Manhattan Institute's Hayek Prize does is highlight and honor the books that show the connection between Hayek's insight and what's really happening in the world. The 2018 winner of the Hayek Prize is John Kogan's The High Cost of Good Intentions. It relates directly to Hayek's social democratic road to serfdom. And that's because Mr. Kogan takes a flashlight and shows you all the times our government increased the size of itself without really acknowledging it through little changes in social welfare programs, through multiple increases in social security, through Medicare and Medicaid, gradually over time, and this is what John Kogan traces, the spending on social programs, what we call entitlements, begins to dwarf any other spending that the United States does. One way to avert fiscal disaster is simply growth. Very interesting is Vijay Joshi's book about India because we thought that India would forever be controlled by bureaucracy. Yet when India liberalized, all of a sudden its growth began to outpace anything else. And the question now, as Joshi shows, is can India throw off the shackles of the bureaucratic state? One of the finalists is a book called Machine Platform Crowd by Andy McAfee and Eric Brynjolfsson. What this book does is show the incredible growth that comes from big data, from new innovations in technology. These authors value what Hayek valued, which is letting people freely transact with one another without much government control. Another of our finalists was a wonderful book called Europe's Growth Challenge by Anders Asland and Simeon Jankov. They point out how the social welfare state does shackle European nations, the absent growth that Europe longs for is just waiting for freer economies. They point out that where Europe has freed economies, that, that growth has materialized. And they plot a plan for the future of Europe, which includes restraint of the state. 
Doug Irwin, with his book, Clashing Over Commerce, shows how tariffs impede growth and have impeded growth since the days of the T Act. That is, in the United States, every time we have a tariff, we have an economic cost. Right now, we're considering tariffs on China. Only by reading a book like Irwin's can you see the full cost of tariffs. In the current environment, free marketeers have few weapons. The best weapon, the missing weapon, the needed weapon is a good book, a real explanation of what the free market is about and what it can give society. These Hayek Prize books are those books, a gift to the country at a time when they are much needed. And now I'd like to invite to the stage Amity Schles, the chair of the Hayek Prize, to introduce this year's winner, John Kogan. Good evening. I'd like to take a moment to recognize the members of our jury. Um, president Larry Moan did stand, but I'll ask now Marty Zuvan, because she is present, to stand. Thank you. Brian Anderson. Jim Pearson. Thank you. Don Boudreau, I don't believe is here. John Taylor. Tom Easton. And Mary O'Grady. I'd like also to welcome previous Hayek winners, Philip Hamburger. Philip, could you please stand up? Thank you. And William Easterly, who's right over here. And finally, Jim Epstein, who is a pleasure, made a great video, I thought. Um, he's the maker of our video. I think he might be in the room. It, this is, uh, where's Jim? You here? Yeah, there he is. What a timely book. I know you read in this morning's paper and in yesterday's paper about um, the dire numbers regarding Medicare and Social Security. Um, before little children grow up, those funds will be exhausted. Hayek wrote, the effect of the people's agreeing that there must be central planning without agreeing on ends will be rather as if a group of people were to commit themselves to take a journey together without agreeing where they want to go. Without a revised conception, we are likely to continue to drift in the same direction in which outright socialism would merely have carried us a little faster. That drift is what John Kogan spent his lifetime following, the drift towards socialism via social democracy. Early on, John began tracking, mapping the flow to social democracy and with chilling accuracy at each point, he noted what went wrong and how we drifted farther despite our intentions. As uh, John pointed out, I just want to mention one of his early papers, a study of black employment from 1950 to 1970. The minimum wage was especially tough on southern minority males since they didn't always have the skills employers need Therefore, a social program, the minimum wage, actually hurt the most vulnerable in society. Their disappointment turned those young men away from work, often for a lifetime. Eventually, though, studying wasn't enough for a Scout Kogan, John Kogan. Uh, John's remarkable work in the field has to be mentioned, um, slowing the drift. Much of the prep work in the Reagan administration, work that led to first the 1988 Welfare Reform Act was done in the shadows by Professor Kogan. That law permitted states to opt out of the federal programs and experiment with alternate welfare programs. John next went to Oregon and helped that state develop a welfare program which replaced welfare with job opportunities. 
Oregon reform in turn provided a paradigm for the dramatic welfare reform of 1996. So this is the Kogan welfare reform, AKA the Gingrich or Clinton welfare reform. Uh, congratulations, please note that. And in the field of health, John um, did some work damming the flowing waters as well. He drafted reform that helped government to save costs by allowing seniors to move into managed care. In the book you will hear about tonight, John chronicles what he could not block through his work, entitlements. When entitlement programs start with tight requirements, they nonetheless do end up expanding and contributing to the great drift. I want to just mention that political leaders have often turned to John for support. Among the leaders John has advised or served are not only President Reagan, but also um, Governors Arnold Schwarzenegger and Governor Pete Wilson of California, presidential candidate President George W. Bush, presidential candidate Mitt Romney. Further important material is in the program at your seat. I want to add here to a point, a personal point, about Professor Kogan's magnanimity. Guests often turn up at the Hoover Institution, and not often do they find their way, not always do they find their way to, you know, around the institution. Um, it's a daunting place, it's such an impre impressive place. Um, what John was, as I recall, whenever I went to Hoover, was a welcoming face and a welcoming, more important, a welcoming intelligence. Ready to interact, uh, to hear about what might be done, to explain a few things ab about what might be done. And I, I think that's very important in all of our work. We are, after all, a community and must support one another. Um, I'll close, though, with a comment about John's knowledge from John's colleague, John Taylor, who, as you know, is a former Hayek winner and one of the most esteemed central bankers in the world. John Taylor wrote that John, he emailed me this, John is the most, John Kogan, is the most knowledgeable person on the budget ever and anywhere. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Kogan. <laughs> Bill Amity, thank you very much for those uh, kind words. Uh, and I want to express my sincere gratitude uh, to the um, Manhattan Institute and the Hayek Prize Committee for bestowing this uh, prestigious award on my book. I am deeply honored uh, by the award, uh, and I feel very privileged to be addressing you this evening. So the book uh, was published last fall. And at Hoover, we had a launch. And the launch actually was here in New York and then in Washington, DC. And I have to say, here in New York, got a great reception, a lot of interest. But then I went down to Washington, DC. <laughs> and on a normal day, nobody wants to talk about entitlements down there. But they, the day I picked was a particularly bad day. It was in late October. And it was the day that the Republicans released their tax plan. So nobody was interested in talking about entitlements. And I came back to Stanford, Stanford and I was telling some of my colleagues about the trip. And uh, one of my colleagues said, uh, it could have been a lot worse, John. Could have been a lot worse. He said, I had a book in the 1990s, book on American politics. And um, we had a launch in Washington, DC. And the day that I was there for my launch, was the day that the Monica Lewinsky scandal broke. <laughs> so it could have been a lot worse. But in any event, uh, in writing about the uh, dangers of the collectivist state uh, to individual liberty, entitlements were never far from Professor Hayek's mind. While in the road to serfdom, his focus was on the consequences of government control over the means of production to individual liberty. He did say, and I quote, the demand for security may become a danger to liberty. His chapters in the Constitution of Liberty on the welfare state, 
on Social Security and on income redistribution reflect his growing concern in the late 1950s about the dangers of entitlements. And the growth in entitlements over the last six decades certainly shows that his concerns were well placed. So the high cost of good intentions, the title of my book, I think is an apt description of how we should think about the problem. Entitlements have been created with the very best of intentions. Intentions that spring from the normal human desire to help those in need who are in need because of factors that have been beyond their control. But over time, this system has grown into a costly and complex set of programs that distributes hundreds of billions of dollars each month from one group in society to another with little regard for financial need. The system has strayed far from its well-intentioned original purposes. How far? Well, consider the following statistics. These are from 2016, the last year for which we have data. That year, 54% of all U.S. households were receiving at least one federal entitlement benefit. Now that, of course, includes Social Security and Medicare recipients. Let's set them aside. 40% of all households headed by a person under the age of 65 were receiving benefits from at least one federal entitlement program. Six out of every 10 children are in families that are on the entitlement rolls. 60% of all recipients of entitlement benefits are not in poverty prior to the receipt of those benefits. And a whopping $700 billion is spent each year delivering benefits to individuals that are in the upper half of the income distribution. The cost of this system is enormous. The system's incentives undermine the natural human instinct for self-reliance and create dependency. The staggering fiscal cost represents a very grave threat to continued economic prosperity. So my book tells the story of how we got to this astonishing state. In the 19th century, we see the same forces driving the expansion of entitlement, the same pattern of legislative liberalizations that we do in 20th century entitlements. And we see the same excesses that we see in today's entitlements. One fundamental force that has operated on entitlements for over 200 years is a force that is called the equally worthy claim. And this force originates from the well-meaning impulse to treat all similarly situated individuals equally under the law. So here's how it works. When an entitlement law is first created, for policy reasons or for budget reasons, it confines eligibility to a relatively narrow group of individuals. As time passes, excluded groups come forth to lay claims that they should be receiving assistance, that they are no less deserving of that assistance than the people that have been included initially. Pressure is brought by or on behalf of them to receive assistance. The pressure tends to be magnified during periods of budget surpluses and since the New Deal during periods of economic distress and almost always by public officials' desire to be elected and reelected. Eventually, the government acquiesces and benefits and eligibility are expanded. But the very broadening of the eligibility rules just brings another group of individuals closer to the boundary line, and they begin to clamor for benefits. 
on the grounds that they are no less deserving of assistance than those that are receiving that assistance. And the process begins all over again. This process repeats itself until the entitlement reaches a point where the original goals of the entitlement program are no longer recognizable. So let me give you examples of how this works from history. I'll start with the 19th century. And it's the very first federal entitlement that provides us with a good example of how the forces work. The original program was a Revolutionary War program for disabled soldiers. The program, as it started out, provided benefits only to soldiers and sailors who were in the Continental Army and Navy, who had been injured in battle, and of course, widows of soldiers that died in battle. But starting from this narrow base, Congress started expanding eligibility, first to members of the state militia, and then to volunteers. And eventually, it extended eligibility to any soldier who served during the Revolutionary War. And the last of these extensions, the Universal Service Pension Law of 1832, deserves a little bit of a special comment. The law was not expected to be very costly. After all, 49 years had elapsed since the end of the Revolutionary War. But the law produced this unanticipated flood of beneficiaries. Within a year, the number of veterans on the rolls doubled, and the cost of the program quadrupled. The surge in, in claims was so in incredible that it led former President John Quincy Adams to remark, Serena, Senator Uriah Tracy, and I'm going to quote here, used to say that the soldiers of the revolution never died, that they were immortal. Had he lived this time, he would say that they multiply with the lapse of time. <laughs> The same pattern of legislative expansions was repeated for uh, Civil War pensioners, except on a far, far grander scale. Like the Revolutionary War program, the Civil War program started with an initially narrow group of eligible individuals, injured in battle, fighting for the Union with a criteria. In the early 1870s, when it was thought that anyone who would have qualified for assistance would be on the rolls, there was about 250,000 soldiers and survivors on the pension rolls. Then the liberalizations began. When they ended, Civil War pensions had been extended to virtually all members of the Union Army, regardless of disability. In the 1890s, 30 years after General Lee surrendered at Appomattox, there were nearly one million soldiers and survivors on the pension rolls. Civil War pension expenditures accounted for about 40% of the federal budget in the 1890s, about the same as Social Security and Medicare today. Congress, as it has so often since, badly estimated, underestimated, the cost of the program and how long it would last. Expenditures on Civil War pensions didn't reach their all-time peak until 50 years after the war had ended. Even more remarkable, there is one Civil War pension recipient still alive today. <laughs> now, I know what you're saying. How is that even possible? <laughs> After all, it's been 150 years since the Civil War ended. Well, here's the story. So the recipient is a woman named Irene Triplett. Her father, Mose Triplett, briefly served in the Union Army. This was after signing up and then deserting the Confederate Army. But his union service eventually allowed him to qualify for a pension. 
And then many years after the war, in 1924, Mose Triplett met and married the love of his life, Elida Hall. He was 78, she was 28. <laughs> One of those way, uh, May to December weddings, so common back in those days. In any event, so today, Irene, who was born in 1930, uh, is a survivor, survivor of a Civil War pensioner, hence entitled to a pension. And today, she re receives a modest pension of about $80 a month. It's not too much. But modern entitlements follow the same pattern legislative pattern of expansion as the 19th century entitlements. The original Social Security program was premised on old age poverty protection and covered only about 60% of the workforce. Today, coverage is universal. And along with Medicare, the program provides middle class seniors with a very comfortable benefit. And I'll say more about this later. The original Social Security Disability Insurance Program started out limiting the age of eligibility to 50 years old or older. So you had to be 50 years, or, uh, 50 years old or older, you had to be permanently disabled, and you had to be totally disabled. Today, benefits are, re are provided regardless of age, and to workers who are temporarily disabled and to workers that are partially disabled. The original Medicaid program was designed as a supplement, uh, supplemental assistance for individuals who are on welfare, single mothers, poor disabled individuals, and poor elderly individuals. And of course, today, the Medicaid program serves one out of every four non-elderly US citizens. The excesses of entitlements are just as great today as they were in the 19th century. And I have one example from the 19th century and a corresponding example from the 20th century for you. The 19th century example is from the Navy Disability Pension Program. Navy pensions were provided through the government's first major trust fund. And the trust fund was financed by prize money or booty from captured Navy ships. So in the 1830s, the trust fund was experiencing large surpluses. Congress responded by passing in 1837 the Jarvis Bill. And the Jarvis Bill granted widows, Navy widows, pensions that were retroactive to the date of their Navy husband's death. But the law produced stunningly large awards. One person, Mrs. Sarah Fletcher, the widow of Captain Patrick Fletcher, was awarded benefits back to his untimely death in 1800. Her retroactive lump sum benefit in 1837 totaled in today's dollars $628,000. If there were a Hall of Fame for entitlement recipients, the widow Fletcher would have a prominent place in it. But Mrs. Fletcher was only one of many recipients of the Jarvis Bill's Bonanza. Many others received over $100,000 in today's dollars in a lump sum benefits. The bill bankrupted the Navy Pension Fund. From 1841 forward in time, most Navy pensions were financed out of general revenues. Is this a harbinger of the future? My 20th century <clears throat> parallel is Social Security and Medicare. As a result of benefit increases enacted when we had large surpluses and favorable demographics in these two programs, the benefit levels, as I indicated early, are quite generous. How generous? Well, here's an example. Today, the typical married, typical married couple that reaches age 66 is promised in Social Security 
and Medicare benefits over their remaining life, $1 million in benefits after adjusting for inflation. This from a program originally designed to provide poverty protection for individuals in old age. Not surprisingly, as we heard from the Social Security and Medicare trustees, both programs, like the Navy Pension Fund, are on the way to bankruptcy. Now, the long history of entitlement legislations is one of continual incremental expansions. There are, however, a few notable examples of presidents that have reined in entitlement programs. The first example that I have is an example from the 1930s, and it's the largest reduction of any entitlement, individual entitlement program in U.S. history. It was accomplished by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Now, that may surprise a lot of you, so let me explain. In his first year in office, President Roosevelt removed nearly 400,000 veterans, disabled veterans, from the disability pension rolls and reduced benefits for those remaining on the rolls by an average of 25%. He then spent the next eight years in office fighting Congress and resisting attempts to undo this reduction. So how did this happen? How did it come about? Well, let me explain. President Roosevelt's role, or goal, I'm sorry, in coming uh, to office was to, of course, get the economy back on its feet. After the banking bill, his top legislative priority was to reduce the budget deficit by cutting federal spending. He had campaigned on this uh, and was bound and determined to carry out his campaign pledge in 1933 after taking office. Veterans expenditures at that time accounted for about 25% of the federal budget, and so they had to be on the chopping block. So seven days after taking office, the president proposed that Congress repeal virtually all veterans' pensions programs, and give him the unilateral authority to restrict eligibility and to cut benefits. Ten days later, Congress passed the Economy Act in accordance with the President's wishes. A few months later, the administration issued regulations that drastically cut the program. In the year after the reductions took place, pension expenditures were about half of what they had been in the prior year. So it was a dramatic sweeping cut. Enacting and maintaining these reductions in the face of a congressional backlash took all of the president's formidable skills. First, he avoided a filibuster with an ingenious strategy that required the Senate to filibuster his beer bill that is a beer to legalize the sale of 3.2 beer. Remember, it was prohibition days. So he proposed that Congress legalize uh, the sale of 3.2 beer. But he, he set, set it up so that Congress, if it wanted to filibuster that bill, um, or if it, if it wanted to filibuster the economy bill, it would have to also filibuster the beer bill. So faced with the prospect of returning home, without acting on the beer bill, Congress went ahead and passed both bills. Second, he had to placate uh, veterans who had shown up in Washington, bonus marchers, to demonstrate against the reductions. His approach, vastly different from his predecessors, he sent Eleanor out to sing songs with the veterans, sympathize with them, hear their stories, and two weeks later, the veterans left satisfied that they had been heard. Ronald Reagan provides us with a second notable example of a president successfully tackling entitlements. And it's interesting that President Reagan followed FDR's model. Like President Roosevelt, President Reagan proposed entitlement changes to achieve a larger goal, 
And his larger goal was putting the economy back on its feet and putting the federal finances on a sounder footing. Like Franklin Delano Roosevelt, President Reagan led the effort and backed it up with strong public policy arguments for his initiatives. Like President Roosevelt, Reagan achieved his successes early on and then successfully battled Congress in its attempts to reverse his reforms. All in all, what President Reagan accomplished was to reduce the growth of entitlements by half. It is the largest overall reduction in the growth of entitlements in history, unmatched by any other president. So what are the prospects for entitlement reform? Well, the actions, recent actions by the Congress, by previous Congresses in the last uh, several administrations, certainly don't give us any hope or any reason for optimism. But even more troubling is that many observers of politics say that the advance of the entitlement state can't be checked, that the forces of liberalization are just too strong, that when it comes to entitlements, democracy just doesn't work. Well, I disagree, and here's why. First, the, the changes required to meet the fiscal challenge posed by entitlements, while they're politically difficult, are, from a policy standpoint, quite straightforward. We know what we need to do. We need to simply slow the growth of entitlement spending and increase the growth in the economy. Second, history shows us that restraining entitlements can be done. President Roosevelt and President Reagan provide us with a roadmap. They proposed strong public policy solutions, rallied public support, and cajoled Congress into action. This formula can work again. But we should have no illusions about the damage that excessive entitlement spending can cause. Throughout history, Rising public debt has eventually led to high inflation, stagnant economies, and a decline in standards of living. But I believe that we can enact reforms necessary to control entitlement growth before we reach a point where the cost of excessive debt becomes too severe. There's a final reason for my optimism. Our country has faced many more significant challenges than entitlements. We fought a civil war to correct a fundamental flaw in our Constitution. We then bound the nation together again to propel us forward as a beacon of freedom for the rest of the world. We fought the Soviet Union for several decades, a titanic struggle. We emerged victorious. It was a triumph of freedom over authoritarian rule. By comparison, the entitlement challenge seems to me to be pretty manageable. The source of my optimism comes from the knowledge that we have successfully reigned in entitlements in the past. We have an army of public policy scholars here at the Manhattan Institute, at the Hoover Institution, AEI, and elsewhere. And these intellectual leaders have the capacity to develop policy solutions, educate political leaders, and together move our country to action. We just have to keep devising policies, writing, and speaking on them. And I am pleased to be part of that effort. Thank you very much for your time. Okay. Sure, uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, we have time uh, for some questions. There's microphones, so just raise your hand, wait for the microphone uh, to get to you, and uh, make your question brief. Identify yourself and make your question brief, please. Thank you. Over there. You make a very cogent case for cutting 
uh, for, for cutting existing entitlements, but it seems to me the biggest risk for increased spending is in the medical area, where we're one of the few countries, advanced countries, that don't have it. The Europeans, as I understand it, spend between seven or seven and a half and nine percent of their GNP. We're spending 19 and a half or something like that, and yet yeah. we only cover uh, uh, about two thirds of the people, one way or the other. So it seems to me there's inevitable pressure, at least for the next liberal administration, to have universal medical care, and the cost per capita being so much higher with what we have now with less good results, how do you propose to deal with that? Because it seems to me inevitable that we're going to have pressure for universal medical care. Yeah, a very good question, and, and you're right. When you look at the growth of entitlements, it's the health care entitlements that are uh, powerfully important in driving, in driving that growth. Um, you know, I, um, uh, I, I haven't done a, a lot of study of European systems, but they spend less in terms of dollars, but they ration more. And so individuals um, end up uh, paying for it kind of in a different way. Uh, and the studies that we all hear about, infant mortality being lower in, uh, in European countries and statistics like that, it lowers the lower infant mortality, very, very little reason to believe that ha that has to do uh, with health care, a health care system, and more due to nutritional issues, educational issues, and so forth. I would say it's unambiguous that the United States, the quality of health care in the United States is higher than it is in most European countries. Yes, it's bureaucratic, and yes, it's difficult to deal with, but I wouldn't ever admit that the quality of care in the United States is below that of, of, of European countries or Canada. Uh, and we do pay for it with our dollars, and those countries pay for it through waiting times and the like. Um, what can you do about it is maybe the real heart of your, your question. Uh, and my, my sense is we really need to do two things. Both of them focus on incentives. What's wrong with our healthcare system is all of the incentives are aligned towards higher and higher costs. Individuals pay very little for the health care they receive. We end up with moral hazard, driving up costs. The Medicare system, fee-for-service system, the Medicaid system, fee-for-service system. So physicians have no uh, incentive to rein in the cost of the services they provide to individuals. And the combination of the two tends to drive up uh, health care costs. And so I would say in reforming health care, we've got to go, and it's tough, because you got to go and increase co-payments to get individuals to be more cost conscious, and you've got to have more competitive pressures on healthcare providers to get the, the uh, incentives to drive up costs uh, down. Thank you. Uh, Ravenel, can we get a microphone over here? How would you advise a congressman or senator running to articulate reform for, for entitlements? What would be your, the words you'd put in his mouth? Yes, a very good question. Uh, you know, uh, I've, I've advised presidents uh, and, and governors uh, before, uh, and um, I have to say none of them have taken up uh, the reforms that I've suggested. But Rick, with that in mind, it does seem to me that you've got to You've got to have a message of, to politicians about moving forward, leaving current retirees' benefits in place, and dealing with the problem, which is a future, future problem. You don't have to actually cut benefits in Social Security to get the system in line. All you have to do, surprisingly, is promise each successive cohort, age cohort of retirees, future retirees, the same level of benefits in real terms that today's retirees are getting. So my message to politicians when it comes to Social Security is you don't have to cut benefits. You have to slow their growth. You don't have to take checks out of the mail. And so it's a message that has a practical, positive policy um, uh, solution in it. Second is, we have to be, keep politicians mindful of the economic consequences of excessive debt. 
eventually this debt is going to come down on, on the country and produce uh, economic, extreme economic difficulty, difficulties. And it's very important to remind politicians who's going to end up suffering from that economic distress. It's going to be younger workers. Those are the ones that are going to suffer primarily. And I think that combination of, of uh, message of a solution forward and a very strong message about the consequences of inaction are really the way, the way to go. Okay, uh, Byron, you have a question there? The only person who's really been able to do something about this is Ronald Reagan, and as you pointed out, um, he only slowed the growth yeah. down, uh, even though he wanted to reduce the absolute number. I'm worried that in a democracy, any candidate who argues for any kind of discipline in entitlements is likely to lose an, enough voters so that he'll no longer be in office. It seems to me that politically, the programs that you would advocate are impractical, or at least would be viewed impractical by the people who are running for office now. Great. So okay. that, that makes me very Very pessimistic, yes, Byron. Okay, so let me respond. And I'm gonna give you an example from history as my way of responding. And the, let me, here's a question. Um, I said that Franklin Roosevelt achieved the greatest reduction of any, of any entitlement, single entitlement in US history. Who achieved the second largest reduction? The answer is, well, I'll give you a hint. Who was the weakest president since World War II? Jimmy Carter. <laughs> Everybody answer, Jimmy Carter. <laughs> well, Jimmy Carter reduced future Social Security benefits for individuals who are age 60 and below by 10% and even larger amounts for workers that were in their 40s in 1977. Congress voted through changes that only affected future retirees, but people that were age 60, you know, they weren't far away from retirement. They were affected by 10%, which is the promised benefit by 10%. If you look at the election results in 1978 and 1980, what you find is members of Congress that voted for that reform didn't suffer at the polls. They won re-election at the same rate as those that didn't vote for it, okay? So we've got an example in history where a president, and not a very strong president, facing, key here, facing a problem, and the problem was that Social Security was five years hence going to become insolvent. And that was the impetus for the reform measures. Jerry Ford proposed the reform right before President Carter. Carter came into office, he proposed a very similar one, and it reduced the growth in benefits uh, substantially. And members of Congress went along from it, with it. So I, I would say this, the news about Social Security going in the red, I view as good news for the prospects for reform, because that's, that's gonna be the lever that's going to allow politicians to vote for some reform. And I only hope that they vote for reform sooner than later, because the sooner we begin to tackle the problem, the less draconian any reductions are gonna to have to be, and the more likely they are then uh, to be enacted. Okay, Bill Easterly, you had a question there? Oh, uh, Bill, did you? Okay. okay, wait for the mic. Very, very good point that for those presidents to make the change at the beginning of the administration. Yes. And I think it's a very, very big point because they have, the public has a notorious short memory. That's right. And therefore, after an election, that's the time when it should be done. And that's very true for, uh, for any political activists in the room. Elections are just powerful influencers of public policies. If a president campaigns on a, on a, on a pledge to do something, uh, the electorate holds him to it. Uh, he's at his maximum power during those first nine months of his administration. Uh, and in the case of both Reagan and Roosevelt and Carter, uh, they moved quickly uh, before the, um, uh, the forces of status quo uh, could, could recoup. Uh, and so it's extremely important. The other 
uh, implied uh, important point in this, it's that presidents lead entitlement reform as they lead all major issues. There hasn't been a major entitlement reduction or any significant entitlement restraint enacted without presidential leadership. It only happens if the president is supporting it, is behind it, is pushing it, using his, his uh, political capital uh, to achieve it. We have time for one more question. Uh, the gentleman over, over here, why don't we just do this one final question. Congratulations, Professor, on your well-deserved prize. Oh, thank you. Um, in the past five years, we've seen the rollout of a new entitlement program and the spending associated with it to the tune of some $150 billion to $200 billion a year. In that time, one of the preceding victors of this prize actually um, won it for predicting what would, um, what would come of the economy as a consequence of that spending. In the time since it's been rolled out, have you noticed any um, discernible economic consequences of the spending um, that, that make you fearful uh, for the economy or for the budget um, beyond what was predicted? So we're talking about Obamacare? Of course. <laughs> uh, so, you know, not so much, not so much for the economy because its annual expenditure uh, is, you know, just a still, a, still a small part of, of the uh, size of the economy. But where we, where we see effects are in labor markets. Uh, we see an increase in part-time jobs. We see a uh, difficulty of uh, uh, low-skill workers getting jobs. A, a Obamacare acts as a hike in a minimum wage, uh, and it has the same effects as a minimum wage, and its consequences are for the lowest-skill workers uh, to have reductions in their take-home pay, cuts in their hours of work, or loss of, a, loss of a job. And I think that's sort of what I see as the, the major effect uh, so far. There's only about 10 million people that are receiving Obamacare subsidies now, I think. It might be up to 12 million, but it's really not, not that great yet. Uh, they've kind of put the brakes on it, and uh, hopefully they'll be able to significantly um, uh, take it back, uh, uh, shrink it uh, over the next, uh, next few years. Thank you, Larry.